And today I'm more than honored to have with us um, Dr. Hugh Ross. Uh, good morning to you, Dr. Ross. Good morning. And it must be the evening for you. It's evening here. It's 5 p.m. here at the moment. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. We've got lots of questions, lots of exciting questions. And I'm sure our viewers are going to uh, absolutely be enthralled with your answers. So before we begin, then, please, could you introduce yourself to our UK viewers and explain to them how you came to a personal faith in the existence of God? Yeah, I'm Hugh Ross. I'm an astrophysicist. I also serve on the pastoral staff of a church sandwiched between Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, I'm the founder and president of Reasons to Believe. Uh, that's an organization a lot like Reasonable Faith, uh, where we survey the uh, latest discoveries in the book of nature as a tool to bring people to the book of scripture into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, and I was born, raised, and educated in Canada. I uh, didn't really get to know Christians, uh, not personally anyway, until I was 27. Uh, but I got interested in science uh, when I was seven, astronomy in particular. And it was my studies in astronomy that persuaded me that the universe had a Big Bang beginning. And if there's a beginning to the universe, there must be a beginner. Hmm. So starting in age 17, I began a search for that beginner. I first tried to find him in the writings of Immanuel Kant and René Descartes. That was kind of disappointing. Then I went through the world's holy books. And after an 18-month study of a Gideon Bible that was given to me, in a public school, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Right. And what was it that um, caused you to give your life to Jesus Christ through reading the Gideon Bible? Well, there were a few things. Number one, as I went through the early chapters of Genesis, I realized that everything is correctly stated right. and in the correct chronological sequence. And I knew this was far beyond the science of uh, the author of Genesis. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of my realize. This may actually be inspired by the one that created the universe. And I was particularly impressed to find that all the foundational elements of Big Bang cosmology were written in the Bible by six different Bible authors thousands of years before any astronomer even had a clue that the universe had those characteristics. Hmm. And as I went through the Bible, I found many other examples or the Bible predicted future scientific discoveries and recorded uh, events that not yet had happened in human history. And so that predictive uh, success of the Bible persuaded me this is not just from a human source. This must be uh, from the creator of the universe. And of course, I also got attracted uh, by the moral message of the Bible. I said, this is superior to anything I've seen in any other writing. Hmm. And I said, you know, this is a standard I want to live up to, but I discovered I couldn't do it. Right. And then I recognized the Bible's key message. God is a being who loves us so much that he's prepared to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Hmm. And I have to give credit to the Gideons and every one of their Bibles they handed out, at least in Canada, there's two pages that tell you exactly what you need to do once you become convinced that this is the inspired and errant word from the one who created the universe. Yeah. So I can remember the exact time when I signed my name in the back of that Gideon Bible, uh, giving my life to Jesus Christ. All right. So um, you said that you've studied the other holy books of the world, the other religious books. Didn't you find the Big Bang cosmology in those books as well? Or is the Bible unique with that? The Bible is unique. I mean, I did find some statements in the Quran and in the uh, Mormon texts. Mm -hmm that talked about a beginning of the universe. And I noted that they have borrowed some material from the biblical creation text. But I realized, uh, you know, those are two religions where they accept the Old and New Testament as right. inspired scripture. Yep. So uh, I, I was not at all surprised to find it in those books. Uh, but I found a plenty in both of those uh, texts that contradicted what's in the Old and New Testament. Right. So they didn't consistently told me uh, this can't be. And I was also stunned by how similar the Quran was uh, to the Mormon uh, holy books. Mm. So I says, okay, uh, this is, I, I was convinced there's from the same uh, non-divine source. Okay. 
Right, right, right. So when we talk about the Holy Bible, we're talking about Judaism, the Old Testament texts. We're talking about Christianity. Do uh, the Old and New Testaments, the, the Jewish um, scripture and the Christian scripture, do they align with one another regarding Big Bang cosmology? Oh, they do. I mean, the Old Testament is a lot more detailed and specific about the uh, Big Bang features of the universe. Uh, but in the New Testament, you got Hebrews 11 uh, talking about how the universe we can detect did not come from that which we can detect, mm. uh, which is consistent with what you see in the Old Testament, that there's not only a beginning to the matter and energy of the universe, but the space and time as well. You know, and that's a unique feature of Big Bang cosmology, that you have a space-time beginning. And, uh, you know, I was actually studying the Bible in depth at the same time physicists in Britain and in South Africa were beginning to develop the space-time theorems. And so seeing that concurrence uh, had a big impression on me. Okay. So as a pr uh, professional cosmologist, I think that's what you are, right? A professional cosmologist? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm an astrophysicist. Astrophysicist. Okay. Stars and galaxies. Uh, okay. Uh, cosmology is something I do for fun, uh, but my research specialty was quasars and galaxies. Okay, so as a professional astrophysicist, would yes. you say that there are good reasons to believe in a creator of the universe, kind of outside of scripture, just from the, the data that we get from observing the universe? Yeah, very much so. Uh, the fact that we have space-time theorems that prove that space and time are created entities, mm. and especially the fine-tuning. I mean, when okay. you look at the universe, you realize the entire universe must be exactly the mass that it is, uh, the age that it is, the size that it is, to get one planet in which advanced life is possible. And that's just one of hundreds of different features of the universe that must be fine-tuned to make our existence possible. It's just the whole idea that the entire universe must be exactly the way it is in order for the two of us to have the conversation that we're having. Could you could you explain for our viewers today who, who perhaps haven't heard of fine tuning before uh, what fine tuning is and how that kind of shows the existence of God? Well, fine tuning is basically saying there's very narrow ranges on which certain features of the universe and the laws of physics must possess to make life possible and human beings possible in particular. And that's something I've noticed in our research here at Reasons to Believe, is that when you look at this fine tuning and try to measure the degree to which you have to have things uh, uh, in specific values, the evidence goes up exponentially hmm. when you go from what's necessary to get a simple bacterium to what is necessary to get plants, to what is necessary to get animals. But the greatest jump is what's necessary for billions of human beings to be redeemed from their sin and evil. And so uh, this actually gives you an argument that the Creator must be a personal being. Because we can actually put numerical measurements on the degree of fine-tuning, right. and it measures to be many, many orders of magnitude what any what many of us human beings can achieve and so what you'll see in our books is calculations of how many how many more times uh, the creator of the universe must be more intelligent than we human beings are more knowledgeable than we human beings better finance than us human beings but greater technology in our human beings and basically making a point this must be the work of a personal being because only a personal being can manifest the attributes of intelligence, knowledge, creativity, and power, and care, but to a degree far beyond anything we human beings are capable of. Wow, that's excellent. When I sometimes discuss the existence of God with atheists or even agnostics, sometimes they will raise what they consider a, a problem, which is the multiverse theory or quantum physics or quantum mechanics. Does the multiverse or does quantum mechanics or anything within quantum mechanics, does that pose a problem to the existence of God, in your opinion? Well, there's a physicist here in California, well-known, Leonard Susskind. Uh, he's an atheist, but he says we atheists have got to stop using the multiverse. Right. It's a poor argument, and his point is it explains too much. And I've developed an, an analogy in my book, The Creator and the Cosmos, 
to make his point. I mean, the multiverse is the idea there's an infinite number of universes where each universe is different for every other universe. And therefore, by pure chance, you're going to get a universe just like ours. Yep. By that same argument, you're going to get a universe with an infinite variety of birch tree species. And birch trees peel white pieces of bark. And if you've got an infinite number of universes, one of those species will peel pieces of bark uh, that measure just like A4 sheets of paper. They'll be rectangular, they'll have the same dimensions, the same color, and an infinite number of universes. Uh, those pieces of white bark are going to fall on soils uh, with an infinite variety of chemicals in them that will make markings on those white pieces of bark. And uh, if you collect all those white pieces of bark, they will duplicate all the research papers published by every research scientist in the world throughout human history, which means all those research papers didn't come from the minds of those scientists. The multiverse did it. And my whole point is a philosophical one. If you're going to appeal to a multiverse to say there is no personal God that's designed the universe, at the same time, you're eliminating all the designs that we human beings have achieved. Hmm. And so you're committing a philosophical inconsistency there. Yeah. But I've also argued there's a way to put it to the test positively in this sense. If there is no God behind all this design that we see, then if we continue to measure the universe and its components in greater detail, you're going to reach a point where the design you're discovering, instead of getting more spectacular and its fine-tuned features to make our existence possible, will level off and begin to decline. Right. And we've never seen Not that. seeing that, no. It's gone up, and it's always gone up on all size scales. Yeah. So that's a positive way you can put the atheist version. Now, as a Christian, there are ways I could frame the multiverse so it be consistent with the Bible. Mm. What I've discovered, though, we try to frame it in a way that uh, it supports an atheistic worldview, you get these internal contradictions. Only from a Christian perspective, can you have God creating an infinite number of universes uh, where there's no contradictions? And one thing I notice: the people propose a multiverse uh, from a non-theistic perspective, they all admit that their speculations are subject to the space-time theorems. Hmm. So they're not eliminating deism, they're mainly going after theism. Right, right. And what about quantum physics? Well, Quantum physics is part of the evidence uh, for fine-tuning that points to a god. Yeah. Because the uncertainties are absolutely essential. If you don't have quantum uncertainties, you're not going to have stable atoms and molecules. And we need that for life. Hmm. And when you actually examine uh, how much uncertainty you need, make the uncertainty slightly bigger or slightly lesser, you eliminate the possibility of life. Right. And that's also true statistical mechanics. Uh, the uncertainties we see in statistical mechanics, likewise, must be extraordinarily fine-tuned to make life possible. Hmm. I mean, for example, inside the cell, there's machines that take advantage of the uncertainties in statistical mechanics. And to change that uncertainty slightly, those proteins don't work. Right. And uh, no life is possible. Uh, so, at the quantum level, we see fine-tuned designs just like we do everywhere else. And there's no evidence that quantum physics existed before or causally prior to the universe, is that correct? Well, there are people who are speculating uh, quantum gravity theories, hmm. basically making the point that if we speculate in a very early era of the universe, where we have no capacity to do laboratory experiments, to put our speculations to the test, they're basically saying maybe quantum mechanics operates so differently in that realm, hmm. uh, basically the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds of the existence of the universe, that perhaps we can get around the space-time theorems. But I've written about this in The Crater and the Cosmos, the fourth edition of that book. We're now able to develop experiments and observations where we can at least probe somewhere inside the quantum gravity era. Uh, for example, when we look at the images of distant quasars, um, 
if you've got large quantum space-time fluctuations in the quantum gravity era, hmm. large enough that you've got a possibility of bypassing the conclusions of the space-time theorems, those space-time quantum fluctuations will actually blur the images of distant quasars. We astronomers don't see the blurring. Right. So it tells us that the quantum space-time fluctuations in the quantum gravity era are not as large as what the atheists need. Okay. And uh, our observations of uh, black hole uh, event horizons hmm. has the potential to probe even deeper into the quantum gravity era. And this just simply makes the point. We can never uh, eliminate all the speculations that the non-theists will propose. Hmm. But what we notice is the more we push back the frontiers of ignorance, the stronger the evidence comes becomes for the God of the Bible. A hundred percent of the observational and experimental evidence uh, supports Christian theism. Right. Uh, so the atheists always have to appeal to things we can't measure. So um, recently, Sir Roger Penrose has come forward and he stated that they've discovered six Hawking points, which I believe is electromagnetic radiation. Um, and he says that these six points point to a prior universe that our universe, I guess, was given birth from. Um, is that the correct interpretation of these Hawking points? or And does this have any bearing on, on Genesis at all, the Genesis creation account? What's your opinion on that? Well, he's referring to the maps of the radiation left over from the cosmic creation event, the cosmic background radiation. Right. And uh, the latest maps, that put out by a Planck and uh, the nine-year W map, hmm. uh, he's basically saying there's a possibility that some of the irregularities that we're seeing in those maps might be these Hawking points. But he's very careful to use the word might. He's not okay. saying it. He's saying there's a possibility. Could they? Um, and yeah, and so that basically says we need to get better maps, but that will be challenging. Uh, the maps we have already are quite good, and I, I would say if you actually look at those maps, uh, our best interpretation of those maps are that they support a single beginning, uh, right. big bang beginning of the universe. And what I find ironic about Penrose's statements, in the book that he wrote with uh, Stephen Hawking, you know, they did this course at Cambridge where they debated one another for a whole semester in front of students and graduate students and faculty, and they wound up putting a book out. It's like basically on God, eternity, and time and, the, and cosmology. Uh, a very fascinating debate. Um, and But Penrose said in that book, okay, if you're going to speculate that there is a universe that preceded ours that was collapsing, and transition to a universe that's expanding, you've got the same problem you've got with wormholes. Namely, that you have to join the geometry of a collapsing universe to the geometry of an expanding universe. And uh, mathematically, that's conceivable. Mm. The physical possibility of that happening is zero. Right. Uh, you're not going to join it. I mean, just like you can't take the two, a uh, singularity of black hole A and black hole B have them perfectly meet one another and travel from one space-time realm to another, the probability of getting those two singularities to perfectly touch one another, mm. although mathematically possible, it's just not going to happen physically. Mm. And moreover, it won't be stable. And so the, those two requirements also apply uh, to Penrose's latest speculations. Mm. But he's a theoretical physicist. He admits that it's speculation. He's not saying this is the way it is. Right. So I think people need to carefully uh, read what he says. And uh, he's also on record as saying there must be purpose behind the universe and purpose behind us human beings. Right. So when I read that book where the debate between uh, Hawking and the Penrose, it was like you got two physicists, one defending deism, mainly Stephen Hawking, yeah. and one defending theism, namely Roger Penrose, but as I read the book, I'm not sure either one of them uh, would be a Christian, uh, but where Penrose stood apart is he says, there really is purpose. If there's purpose, there must be a personal a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. Um, so as a 
scientific discovery will be leading us. Has there been anything in recent scientific discoveries that have made you kind of reformat your model at all? Definitely, uh, but it's always been an exciting thing for me with okay. rare exceptions. Uh, <laughs> for example, a paper just got published a week ago in Science Advances where they said, if you want to have a planet with life on it, you have to have a small planet orbited by a gigantic moon where they form in such a way that both begin with a liquid iron core and are close enough to one another that you actually get a coupled magnetosphere between the two and without that the planet's going to lose its water and it's going to lose its atmosphere basically making the point if you want life you could have an earth moon system exactly like ours with the precise history that it has and uh you know, the authors ended the paper by saying this is a habitability requirement, uh, but from a Christian perspective, it's another advance in our fine-tuning argument. Yeah. I mean, if that's a habitability requirement, uh, that the probability of finding a small rocky planet orbited by a small or big rocky moon where they're close together and spiraling away from one another, where they both have a liquid iron core, and uh, they have to be close enough together that they exert tidal forces on one another. Because if you have a liquid core, that won't give you a magnetic field. Right. You have to have convection currents inside the liquid core. Okay. And the only way you're going to get convection currents is by having strong tidal forces, uh, both bodies exerting on the other one, which means the moon, moon. Hmm. must be a significant fraction of the mass of the planet. Wow. And that's where our moon sticks out like a sore thumb. It's 50 times bigger than any other moon when you compare its mass to the mass of its host planet. Okay. So if I was an atheist hearing this, I could turn around and say, well, the universe is so big, there has to be a planet like Earth with a moon that size, with a sun the perfect distance away in the Goldilocks zone, for instance. Um, is that a good argument? Well, I mean, astronomers basically look at the universe and say, Everywhere we look, except for planet Earth, we see conditions hostile for advanced life. There are some that are speculating there might be planets out there in which bacteria could exist for a short period of time. But even getting bacteria to exist for three billion years, we're not finding any site beyond Earth where that is conceivable. Right. And uh, without that, you're not going to have advanced life. We need three billion years of diverse, abundant bacterial uh, life here on planet Earth in order to transform the planet chemically where advanced life could be possible. And so there's a growing consensus in the astronomical community, maybe bacteria, uh, but not the equivalent of human beings or even animals on another planet out there. Okay. Uh, and, you know, just what I shared, the fact that we're coming up with all these habitability requirements so, you know, when NASA says there's 40 billion habitable planets in our galaxy, all they're looking at is the condition for liquid water on the surface of the planet. That's one of only 14 known uh, planetary habitable zones. Mm. And so for a planet to be truly habitable, it's not enough that it reside in one of those zones. It must simultaneously reside in all 14 as every few months go by, we discover another one that has to be added to the list. Right. Uh, but even the 14, we now know of 4,350 planets that exist in our galaxy. And of all those planets, we know of only one planet that exists in even three of those 14 habitable zones. And uh, your viewers get one guess as to which planet that is. Okay, we often hear on the news as well that they found a meteorite with bacteria on or there's a moon on a planet that seems to be producing a gas that shows there's organic life on the surface. Is this organic life, is it, has it been transported from the Earth onto the meteorites or onto the, onto the distant moons of planets within our solar system and it's producing these gases? I mean, what's your take on that? That's a possibility, but it's also a possibility that these uh, molecules that they're finding are by abiotic processes. Right. Because there are ways you can make those gases abiotically, 
and you know in the recent announcement that they found phosphine um, that's now debated people are wondering did they really find oh, it okay uh, but they're finding it at parts per billion hmm. I mean so very, very small amounts very tiny amounts hmm. and for example we know enough about the chemistry of interstellar molecular clouds that we recognize these building blocks of the building blocks of light molecules are being manufactured in these clouds but there's also chemistry that destroys them right. almost as rapidly as they're made mm. which is why we're not finding them at uh, you know a hundred parts per million uh, in fact the discovery of phosphine it was 40 parts per billion right. and somebody said wait a minute it's only 20 parts and now they're wondering whether they found it at all okay and so uh and if they're if they're at that low level in abundance it's of no help to any conceivable naturalistic origin of life model. On the other hand, we're talking within our solar system. Uh, it's inevitable because of how long and abundant life has been here on planet Earth. Earth has infected the whole solar system. Yeah. And so I wrote an article gee, a, den a dozen years ago basically saying we need to go back to the moon mm. uh, because the moon is Earth's attic. Yeah. Uh, we know there's 20,000 kilograms of earth rocks and earth soil on every 100 square kilometers of the moon. Wow. And one ton of earth rocks and soil contains about 100 quadrillion uh, microbes. And earth's geology has destroyed the fossils of earth's first life. But the moon has essentially no geology. We can go to the moon and we will find the fossils of Earth's first life. And atheists have a very different idea of what those fossils will look like compared to theists. Mm. I got to speak on this subject at uh, NASA Houston uh, to the scientists and astronauts there and said, you guys need to go to the moon. Let's forget about Mars, go back to the moon with a different mission, yeah. and you'll be able to prove who got it right, the theists or the non-theists. And last time I checked, that made up 100% of the U.S. taxpayer base. So this ought to be a thrilling achievement for you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, maybe it sounds like a silly question, but how did all of the Earth, matter, and organic material get up onto the moon? Oh, uh, well, through meteoritic bombardment. Yeah. I mean, every time an asteroid, a comet, uh, or a meteor of sufficient size impacts the Earth, it will cause Earth material uh, to be dispersed flung, flung up, yeah. so we're going to find the remains of earth life on mars we're going to find it on the moon we're going to find it in the upper atmosphere of venus uh, but probably the best place to look for it is on the moon it's received the greatest supply wow now i hope you don't mind we're going to go all sci-fi on you now if that's okay sure. so we want to talk about ufos and uaps which is uh, unidentified aerial phenomena uh, lots of people now are claiming even professional airline pilots and people in the military are saying that there are unidentified flying objects or aerial phenomena um, as a astrophysicist as a cosmologist as a Christian could you give us some insight possibly into what these are are these space aliens from another planet are these interdimensional beings are they angels what are these sightings well uh, I wound up becoming an expert on UFOs not by design Okay. When I was 16, I organized a booth at an exhibition in Vancouver, British Columbia, and they put our astronomy booth right next to the Flying Saucer Club. <laughs> okay. so from that point onward, I became the one that had to process all the UFO reports. So I did that at the University of British Columbia, University of Toronto, and at Caltech. And what I discovered is 99% of what people report as UFOs can be identified right. as natural phenomena, uh, military experiments, or hoaxes, but there's a 1% residual. Yeah. And I wound up writing a book on this with two of our colleagues here at Reasons to Believe, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, because we wanted to give people a scientifically testable model on UFOs. And uh, we basically cited uh, six physicists, none of them who are believers, who devoted decades of research on this, who point out uh, that the 1% residual, which we cannot identify, they violate the laws of physics. 
but we can prove that they are real, which means we're dealing with non-physical reality. Right. Which explains why a professor I had at the University of Toronto, we had Carl Sagan come uh, for a week-long visit in the summer. He says there's no such thing as UFOs, but his worldview would not tolerate the possible existence of non-physical reality. As a Christian, my worldview does, hmm. and the evidence is overwhelming. We got 2,000 crash sites where you can see a little crater. Uh, you can see the vegetation is damaged, snow is melted, uh, but there's no artifacts or debris. If a physical object crashes into the earth, you can recover something. In these cases, there's nothing. And there's even cases where observers, human observers, saw the UFO going through the atmosphere and then crashing into the earth. And uh, there was no heat friction when it went through the atmosphere. Right. No sonic boom. If it's a physical object uh, moving at 18,000 miles per hour, you're going to get a sonic boom. You're going to get heat friction. We don't see that. And it was Alan Hynek, the American physicist, who coined the term close encounters and basically made the point that humans who have these close encounters with the phenomena that fall into the category of non-physical reality, the effects are always deleterious. It's never right. uh, The best you're going to come away with are recurring terrifying nightmares. I uh, say, what's the worst case scenario? There's documented cases of people being killed by the encounters right. and animals being killed. Mm. So this is not a benign phenomena. They mean to do us harm, yep. uh, which is why I, as a believer, think that this is the handiwork of the fallen angels, the demons. Mm. So, and I find fascinating, we cite this in our book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, six physicists who have devoted more than a decade to researching the UFO phenomena, all agree that what's behind these UFOs uh, is identical to what's behind uh, witchcraft and the occult. Okay. What I've done in my book is to say, the Bible warns us to avoid the occult. And if you will eliminate the occult from your life, it'll be the end of your UFO experiences. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you bring the occult into your life in sufficient quantity, you're going to start having recurring experiences. But I also cite evidence that there's a direct correlation between the number of people who have these close encounters uh, with non-physical real phenomena and the degree of uh, commitment to the occult. Right. So I spoke in the Soviet Union when the communists were still running the show and I discovered the percentage of the population that was having these UFO encounters was far higher than anything I saw in Canada or the U.S. But that's because a much larger percentage of the population was involved in the occult. Right. What's happened today is the occult has become unpopular in Russia, and therefore the incidence has dropped. Oh, okay. So these correlations, I think, tell us a lot. Hmm. So are... Th just trying to wrap my head around this so yeah. we're potentially saying these could be interdimensional demonic beings um right. are they using physical craft to operate within a physical world or are, are, is this an illusion or because i can remember reading in the book of daniel when an angel is sent to, to daniel and i think in the hebrew language it says that he kind of traveled at breakneck speed and in incredible speed to go to the prophet daniel to give him revelation from god um are we saying then that these demonic beings when they enter a physical world they need a physical craft to move in or, or well was that, was that speculation uh, yeah, what we get from the Bible is that God has created two distinct species of intelligent beings, mm. humans and angels. And we humans are constrained by the physics of the universe. The angels are not. Yep. They live in a realm that's distinct from the universe, but unlike us, they have the capacity to come into a realm and leave our realm. We can't go to their realm, but they can come to our realm. Right. And when they come into our realm, uh, they will come uh, through a non-physical means, but they can even manifest temporarily a physical entity. So, for example, you see in Scripture uh, that there were angels that ate dinner uh, with Lot, yeah, yeah. and uh, likewise with Abraham. 
Mm. Uh, so they are capable of some physical uh, capacity, uh, but in terms of the UFO phenomena, mm. what we see uh, on uh, you know uh, spaceships and aircraft and on the ground, a hundred percent of the evidence is that it's not a physical uh, okay. manifestation. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, when people get killed, something physical is happening. When they crash into the earth, there is a crater. So there's physical effects, uh, but the cause of this, uh, we can't identify anything physical to the cause, which is why you got people like Jacques Vallée, uh, who's probably done the most research on UFOs, saying we're dealing with interdimensional beings, mm. beings that are not constrained by the dimensions of our universe. Yeah. But that's identical to what the Bible describes as angels. Mm. Okay, um, so some uf uf ufologists, I think they're called ufologists, um, they will point to Genesis chapter 6 uh, regarding the sons of God coming down and intermarrying with human women, showing that these are obviously alien or extraterrestrial, even perhaps interdimensional beings. Um, so what, what's your take on that? Because there are different opinions as to what the sons of God are. Some would say it's the line of Seth. Uh, others would say that these are fallen angels. And of course, another question, sorry, just to follow up on that, is if they are fallen angels, why would God give um, angels in the first place human genitalia and human sperm to intermarry with human women if they were never supposed to procreate in the first place? So could you give us some insight on that? Yeah, I actually devoted a whole chapter and appendix to this uh, question in my book, Navigating uh, Genesis, mm -hmm. so people can go there for the details. Okay. Uh, but certainly that is a possible interpretation uh, of the Nephilim, that it was fallen angels that came and impregnated uh, human women and gave rise to the Nephilim. And some evidence to support that particular interpretation, as you mentioned, there's other interpretations. Yeah. You have to realize there's not a lot of content in the Bible on this, mm. and it always gives you room to speculate. Uh, but when you look at uh, uh, Goliath and Og, the king of Bashan, uh, they had superhuman characteristics. Mm. Uh, I, I write in that book about the physics of basketball, uh, that basketball is a sport where your ability to sink a basket uh, goes up with a square of your height. So if you're wanting to put together a championship team, just get the tallest people you can find. But what we recognize is with increasing height, you lose mobility. Mm. And uh, the mobility becomes really uh, catastrophic uh, once you get past eight feet. Yeah. And uh, you, know, you basically are constrained to a wheelchair. Right. Uh, but Goliath was at least nine feet, nine inches tall. I mean, Og had a bed that was 13 feet long uh, made out of iron, so he was even bigger than Goliath. Uh, and yet, Goliath could go into battle with a minimum of 250 pounds of armor and weapons. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was defying the laws of physics. The laws of physics tell us uh, that if you're a physical being and you're bipedal, uh, that there's a limit to how tall you can be uh, before you're incapacitated. Mm -hmm. And Goliath was beyond that limit. Okay. which has caused some people to point out there had to be something beyond the physics of this universe mm. that explains a person of Goliath. And uh, yet people say, but the Bible says that angels do not marry. Yep. It does say that, but it doesn't say they cannot marry. It mm. just says that they do not marry. And uh, you also see an interesting passage in Jude's verse 6 yep. where it talks about this special prison, the abyss, mm and how God has consigned demons to that abyss who, quote, left their estate. Yeah. And when you look at that in the Greek, uh, it would be consistent with angels that committed bestiality. Yeah. And, uh, evidently, the fallen angels don't like the abyss, because uh, notice when Jesus cast out demons, they always said, don't send us to the abyss. Yeah. And evidently, is reserved for only those who violated the command that God gave them do not touch these human beings. Okay. So, uh, however, I do admit that uh, there's other explanations. Mm -hmm. People have speculated maybe it's demon-possessed men mm -hmm. uh, bred with these women, uh, or maybe that it was a special breed of humans. Maybe conditions were different at that time. Um, I'm a little skeptical of that interpretation. That was simply the sons of Seth. 
under different laws of physics because hmm. the Bible tells us explicitly there's been no change in the laws of physics hmm. Jeremiah 33 uh, Romans 8 are texts that do that so but again it's an open question hmm. uh, but the Bible does warn us there are angels out there that mean us harm yes there are angels out there that mean to assist us so I mean there, there's both righteous angels and evil angels and it tells us in Hebrews 13 we entertain more of them than we think yeah I think I think the fallen angel view is the most consistent with the rest of scripture I think that's probably yeah. the view that I take but it's the, the mechanic the mechanics of it I wasn't certain of right right especially since God was so intent on eliminating these Nephilim yeah I mean the flood wiped out the Nephilim that were procreated before mm. and uh, evidently these uh, uh, sons of God came back and then God raised up David's mighty men and they took care of the last of the Nephilim mm. so uh, and I heard you mention once about the origin of the Philistines where they came from yes they came from the Isle of Crete uh -huh. and there's only one other place where you see literature talking about uh, superhuman uh, men coming down and, uh, on the Mount, Mount Olympus is that correct or yeah I mean yeah. Uh, so uh, you got the titans in, uh, in Greek uh, literature, yeah. and then you got what you see uh, in uh, the, the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and what you notice is uh, you only see men mentioned, not yeah. women, and uh, they got birth defects mm. six fingers and six toes. Ah, okay, yeah. So th that's all evidence that uh, we may be looking at uh, these uh, fallen angels. Mm. Uh, committing something that God commanded them not to do. Mm. And the other thing I've noticed too, just in my own experience in dealing uh, with uh, demons, they seem incredibly obsessed with sex. Mm. So, uh, and you see that in the UFO phenomenon as well. Right. So there is this obsession, and why would that obsession be if they had no capacity for it? It's true. Yeah, it's very interesting. Another another question I'd like to ask, I know you've mentioned this before, uh, the extraordinary long ages of people prior to the flood. And uh, you seem to give some evidence that this is this could literally scientifically be true. Well, part of the evidence comes from Britain. Uh, there's a, an astronomer in Britain, uh, Wolfendale. He's been in partnership with a Russian uh, astronomer, Ehrlichan. And for three decades, they've been researching what's called the cosmic ray knee, which is basically making the point that when you look at the cosmic rays that are bathing our planet, uh, more than 95% of the heavy nuclei, fast moving cosmic rays, those are the ones that are gonna do us the most physical harm, come from a single supernova eruption event where the eruption took place less than 100,000 years ago oh, okay. relative to the Earth. And in their latest research, Wolfendale and Ehrlichan says, we think we've identified the remnant. And it's basically the Monoceros ring, which goes about 25 degrees across the sky, which means this is a supernova that erupted relatively close to the Earth. And uh, so I talk about, again, this is in Navigating Genesis. One scenario is you got human beings living before the supernova eruptions, and they wouldn't be exposed to the radiation that we're being exposed to. The other thing you notice in scripture, not until after Noah's flood did humans become globally distributed. Hmm. And therefore, if you got humans living in sedimentary plains and not exploiting igneous rocks, they'd be protected uh, from the radioactive decay of uranium and thorium, which is the second big source of radiation exposure uh, we human beings have to deal with. And so given they had a different radiation environment than we do today, there would be the possibility that they could live a lot longer than we do. Uh, but there would also have to be some supernatural intervention, in my opinion, because right now uh, our chromosomes get shorter and shorter as we get older and older. Right. And that's actually a good thing. If they weren't getting shorter and shorter at the rate that they are, we'd be dying earlier deaths from cancer. Uh, so it actually helps extend our life. Right. Uh, however, if you don't have the radiation risk, there wouldn't be the need to have our chromosomes get shorter 
at such a rapid rate, and therefore we could live longer. I mean, none of us are going to make it much past 120 because our chromosomes will be too short for us to actually live. Right. And the other thing you see in scripture is vegetarian diet. Uh, if you want to live to 900, uh, you have to avoid eating meat. You will concentrate too many heavy metals in your body. Okay. And I'm not saying you have to be a vegetarian now. Yeah, I can't do that. Gonna... <laughs> I like my steak too much. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so uh, an interesting theory developed by physicist Dr. Gerald Schroeder uh, is that as space expands, so time uh, stretches with it. And Dr. Schroeder has calculated from our perspective that the universe is 13.8 billion years of age, but with God's original perspective, it would now actually only be about five and a half days old. Are you familiar with this argument, and is it a sound argument? And can we look at Genesis in this way? Well, I read Schroeder's books and uh, actually had dinner with them when I was oh. speaking at uh, Texas A&M University. In fact, both of us spoke that evening because uh, we shared the Trotter Prize, so we got to address the physics and astronomy department there, but we got to discuss this. We had a friendly discussion on it. And uh, the point I was making is, first of all, once we recognize the creation days in Genesis 1 are six consecutive long periods of time, there really is no need to appeal to God telling us a story from a relativistically time-dilated frame. Uh, moreover, if you look at Genesis 1-2, it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of waters of planet Earth, which implies that the God is telling us the story of creation from the same space that we're in. Okay. Uh, and as Schroeder admitted to me over dinner, he's been revising his model uh, over uh, more than a decade because there was a time we thought the universe was 15 billion years old. So he kind of worked out the numbers to make it work and he had to keep revising it. Now he's saying 13.8. But he does admit he's got way too early of a date for God creating Adam and Eve. Right. He's got Adam and Eve at about a half billion years ago, and that's way too early. So he says, yeah, I'm still working on it. And uh, I also recognize that, uh, you know, he is an Orthodox Jew, uh, but he's unusual and that he gives credence to the Kabbalah. You know, I've met many Orthodox Jews that say, hey, it's the Tanakh, the Old Testament, uh, and the... Uh, uh, what do they call that commentary on the Old Testament? The, uh, the, the Talmud, the Mishnah? Yeah. Yep. yeah. Many of them will say, I hold the Talmud and the Tanakh equal in authority to one another. Uh, Schroeder says, it's the Tanakh, uh, the Talmud, and the Kabbalah. Okay. So most Orthodox Jews will not go that far because the uh, Kabbalah is highly mystical. Mystical, yeah. And, and it's filled with numerology. And that's where Schroeder's getting his numerology from. It's from the Kabbalah. Uh, but I'm basically saying none of that's necessary once we recognize that a literal reading of uh, Genesis 1 and 2 uh, forces the belief that the creation days are not 24 hours. They're six consecutive long periods of time. Hmm. Um, so some people would say, well, how, how was the sun created on uh, day number four? And, you know, how does the book of Job help with this, with the cloud covering? How, how, does, how can you tie that into Genesis chapter 1? Well, I never heard of that until I came to the U.S. and uh, met Christians who seemed bothered by that. Because when I first read Genesis, I noted right away, it doesn't say on creation day 4 that God created the sun. Yeah. It says, let there be the, the great lights. And so it says, okay... Uh, the sun may have been created before. And I believe that the sun was created before the six days of creation. And on creation day one, again, the text says, let there be light. It doesn't say that God created the light. He did that in the beginning, Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.3 is when the light that God created for the first time penetrated to the surface of planet Earth. <laughs> and you mentioned Job. Hmm. Uh, Job actually gives far more scientific details on the creation days than you get in the book of Genesis, especially Job 37, 38, and 39. 
and Job 38 verses 8 and 9 uh, talks about a, mo a time in the past history of the earth when God had blanketed the seas had blanketed the waters with clouds that kept the seas dark basically explicitly stating the reason why it was dark on the face of the waters in Genesis 1-2 earth had a cloud layer that wouldn't let visible light through now as a 17 year old reading that for the first time I had enough astronomy under my belt to realize any planet the size of the earth is going to begin with an atmosphere that's so thick uh, visible light will not make it through to the surface mm. same thing as Venus uh, you know Venus today has a thick atmosphere and the only visible light that gets through is at the very deep red end of the spectrum Earth had an atmosphere three times thicker than that of Venus so no visible light would have gotten through so that's so, why that's why there was darkness on the on the surface of the deep then in Genesis one. Day one when you get to day four it says let there be the great lights and keep in mind it says let there be the great lights so that they may serve as signs to mark seasons days and years and again at age 17 I said well for whose benefit Hmm. And then I notice on creation day five, God creates animals. Animals are the one life form that must know the position of the sun, moon, and stars in the sky to regulate their biological clocks. So I said, okay, that makes sense. The atmosphere has got to go from translucent to transparent if you're going to have animals. And uh, I wrote a blog. It's in June of 2018. It's on our reasons.org website where I talk about an experiment that physicists did where they took the atmosphere of the earth duplicated that in a flask and changed the oxygen content because we know just before animals appeared in the face of the earth there was less than one percent oxygen in earth's atmosphere and the great unconformity caused that to jump up suddenly to eight percent and when it hit eight percent you immediately got animals that's the Avalon explosion uh, and so they did this experiment uh, in this uh, flask and what they discovered at 1% the atmosphere is a thick haze at 8% it's transparent oh, okay. and so that explains what we see there in Genesis 1 hmm. you've got a hazy atmosphere for the first three creation days on day 4 that thick haze gets transformed into a transparent atmosphere and now these future animals will be able to see where the sun moon and stars are in the sky right. well thank you so much for your answers today dr ross just as we close now please could you share with our viewers uh, what steps they could take to start a relationship with god for themselves well, that's a great question and it tells us in ecclesiastes 3:11 that god has written eternity on the hearts of every human being and it's something I've noticed, even in my debates with atheists, is that they can't escape the fact that there's this just sense that we have some ultimate purpose and destiny uh, that's written on our hearts. But it's also written on our hearts that there's a moral law we're all expected to live up to and obey. You see that in all the cultures of the world. Uh, but no human being uh, can live up to the standards of their own conscience we all fall miserably short uh, what we see uh, written on our hearts uh, but as you look at the universe as we look at the earth we see just how much there's a creator there who's provided for us and he's provided for us extravagantly which means he loves and cares for us a great deal which means he must be committed to do for us what we can't do for ourselves and that's what I found in the Bible how the Bible actually describes the account of how the creator of the universe came to planet earth as a humble human being took on human form and in human form he paid the redemptive price but we're not able to pay for ourselves and if we will receive that price then the promise is he will send the Holy Spirit and begin to transform us and deliver us step by step from what we can't deliver ourselves and you know, that's what the Gideons explained to me when I was 19. Basically said, you know, you need to make the creator of the universe the boss of your life. Mm. Why? He knows better than you do 
what's best for you. It just makes good sense to put him in charge and then just submit to the work that he wants to do inside of you and you will see him begin to transform your life. And so that's the heart of the Christian faith, uh, receiving the gift of redemption that Jesus Christ has made available to us through his sacrifice on the cross. Put him in charge of your life. Let the Holy Spirit begin to transform you. And the promise we got in the Bible is you'll actually see visible evidence of that transformation. Not so much what you do, but he says he's going to give you new desires and new powers to live the Christian life. That's your proof. And it's worked for you and it's worked for me. It has. Yeah. It's working every day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Ross. And just as we close now, please could you share with our viewers how they can um, interact with your ministry, how they can get your resources? Where's the best place to find you? Oh, well, we have a website, reasons.org. It's deep with tens of thousands of articles and podcasts and debates that people can watch. They can get free copies of the books that our scholars have written, uh, reasons.org slash the last name of the scholar. So for me, it's reasons.org uh, slash Ross. And uh, we have chapters, so people can join chapters. Uh, just like you have chapters, uh, we have chapters uh, literally around the world. Uh, and they can ask questions. All of our scholars have a Facebook and Twitter page. We don't tell you what we're eating. We use it for ministry only, uh, but people are free to pose questions to us, and we do our best to answer them. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Ross. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion, and uh, love to have you on again uh, in the future, if you would be willing to do that. I always love talking to the Reasonable Faith chapters. They're great. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, okay, then. Well, I'm Paul Lyndon Burtwell, and you've been watching Compelling Reason. Until next time, God bless you.